We all know that you're upset that Star vs. the Forces of Evil is over. It ended beautifully, but... I kinda wish there was more of it. Thankfully, like Gravity Falls, Star vs. does have a full story for us to study and put into a chronological timeline. So let's indulge in a completely new perspective on the rise and fall of Magic, Muni, and the Butterfly family. I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and this is the complete Star vs. the Forces of Evil timeline. I also am recording this intro after I've recorded the voiceover for the video, and the word butterfly has completely lost all meaning to me, and every time I say it, I feel like I'm saying it wrong. It is pronounced butterfly, right? I'm not losing my mind. All right, my fried brain aside, we do have a few notes before we get started. I love this show, but it's not so great at giving exact dates and times. Apparently, only Solario was, uh, <clears throat> kind and compassionate enough to chronicle her rule in cold hard years. So a lot of this timeline is educated guessing from all of us at Frederator, but they are incredibly educated guesses. Seriously, we did some painstaking math to try to get all of this right. Oh, there was so much math. Like, figuring out how old the Queens of Muni were when they had their children is kind of a doozy. Since so few of these powerful ladies seem to prioritize childbirth over ruling Muni, we're gonna assume that each queen gave birth to their first child around the age of 30, since we have nothing better to go on. Oh, and by the way, while Muni and Earth do have different calendars, time passes through both at the same rate, so we're gonna be using Earth years for our timeline. Not that dates or times are gonna be super important right now, because we start at the literal beginning of time. The Wheel of Progress, the beginning of time. The universe gets started when Father Time begins running inside the Wheel of Progress, which causes time to move forward. Don't ask how we got there, the universe is allowed to have its own mysteries. The Realm of Magic and Glossaric comes into existence, a ridiculously long time ago. Through whatever forces, magic comes into existence in the Realm of Magic. This realm and its incredibly pretty golden liquid is the source of magic in all dimensions, and as such it has a gateway into every dimension in the shape of a waterfall. Any mortal who comes into the realm immediately loses their memory and becomes childish. However, a strange little man named Glossaric comes into being as an intermediary between mortals and magic, and his alignment is famously, or infamously, true neutral. You'll never get him on your side. But I don't have a side. You don't, do you? Glossaric creates Omnitraxus Prime, still a ridiculously long time ago. Over his lifetime, Glossaric would create several beings to help him manage the vast world of magic. His first creation is Omnitraxus Prime, whose job is to manage the multiverse and make sure it doesn't, you know, eat itself, effectively making him the master of space-time. Glossaric creates Lekmet and the Magical High Commission, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Wow, that's literally almost a number. Once intelligent life exists in the universe, it becomes clear that Glossaric would need more hands on deck to oversee everyone's usage of magic, so he creates Lekmet to remind everyone of the impermanence of their existence. One such way of reminding them was that every time Lekmet used his powers, his lifespan would shorten. Glossaric also founds the Magical High Commission with Lekmet and Omnitraxus Prime to monitor all magical activity in the multiverse. Glossaric creates Hecapu, the concept of dimensional scissors, and Romulus thousands of years ago. Eventually, it becomes clear that people would need a way to hop from one dimension to another, so Glossaric creates Hecapu and gives her the unique power to create dimensional scissors, which create a portal to almost any dimension for people to jump through. To get a pair of these scissors from Hecapu, you have to pass an incredibly difficult and sometimes long trial. You can also just, you know, steal some. Likely around this time, Glossaric also creates Romulus to be the muscle of the Magical High Commission. He apparently serves no higher purpose other than being awful. Humans arrive in Muni and Glossaric creates the wand around 1200. A small handful of humans arrive on Earth, which look like pilgrims for some reason, even though the timing for the pilgrims would make literally zero sense. This is one of those inconsistent rabbit holes I mentioned earlier. The original writer of this video literally wrote a footnote that was like a page long trying to explain this, but the calculations landed around the year 1200, so that's what we're rolling with. Anyway, some humans wearing some drastically ahead of their time fashion fall through Earth's well of magic into the magical realm. The group eventually winds up traveling through the portal to Muni with absolutely no idea who or where they are. Luckily, Glossaric happens to be traveling through time with baby Meteora. He intercepts them at the shore and informs them that they're the first settlers to Muni. Then he places a baby unicorn from the magic-filled sea into Meteora's rattle, transforming it into the wand. He gives the wand to a random settler who, we assume, becomes the first queen of Muni. Glossaric nonchalantly tells the humans, You can do magic with that thing. 
Okay. So, you know, I'm sure this is one of Glossaric's afterthoughts that won't have any bad repercussions whatsoever. Oops, we've barely started this video. Glossaric also suggests that the new settlers take shelter from a coming storm in a nearby stump. This saves the group's lives, creates a sense of general camaraderie, and would become the basis for the Mewman holiday stump day. Mewn Appendance, about 1210. Of course, Muni was already inhabited. Shortly after the human or Mewman settlers arrive, a war breaks out between them and the previous inhabitants, the monsters. Naturally, historical accounts accounts of how this come to pass vary wildly between monster and Mewman perspectives. The Mewman queen is said to have used magic to turn the weak peasants in her party into strong soldiers. After several years of fighting, half the monster population is massacred and the Mewmans win. Well, sort of. The Mewmans would be dealing with an on-again, off-again war with the monsters for something like the next 800 years. Magic becomes relegated to the sanctuary, sometime in the 1200s. When the settlers' boat first crashed into Muni, the entire ocean near Muni was made of the same golden magical liquid as the Realm of Magic. While future queens would eventually come to believe that the first queen discovered the sanctuary, the truth is that an early queen was likely responsible for building the sanctuary and then containing the magic within. The Lucitors steal half of Muni's population, around 1600. Butterfly Kingdom would come to be the capital and literal center of Muni, but several other lesser kingdoms would develop around, above, and below them. Around 1600, the Lucitors pull half of Muni's population into the underworld. This severely wounds the Butterfly royal lineage and the remaining population. For a century, the monarchy would suffer from scandal, shame, and and general incompetence. First Butterfly Castle and Book of Spells destroyed, 1709. We don't know a lot about the first 26 queens of Muni because the history of Muman queens is recorded in the Book of Spells and in tapestries in Butterfly Castle. It's too bad the first version of the castle and the Book of Spells are destroyed by Dragonfire during Queen Lyric's celebration for Princess Skywind's wand passing ceremony, because now all that's pretty much lost to time. Skywind would begin a new Book of Spells three years later when she becomes queen. Butterfly Castle proves trickier. The first was made of wood, partially from the stump, so naturally the whole thing burned up. Construction begins torturously slowly and wouldn't be finished for another four years. Or technically another nine. Now Queen Skywin uses a time repetition spell to turn one day into five years. Muni expands, 1720. Even with the castle done, Muni citizens rely on Queen Skywin to magically conjure them food, and their general ineptitude makes them easy fodder for frequent monster raids. Fed up, the queen eventually refuses to conjure food anymore. She clears the forests and the monsters around the castle and Mewmans learn how to farm. Their population quickly doubles, which causes them to build more and more into monster territory. The Mewmans learn to fight and start skirmishing over land use. Romulus gets snakes for hands, 1725. Glossaric's been MIA ever since the book burned. He's been dealing with Romulus and giving him a lesson by turning his hands into snakes, but Glossaric returns in 1725. Solaria becomes queen, 1755. After her significantly older brother, Justin the Unqueen has a brief run as the Prince of Muni, embracing the celebrity lifestyle of being the next heir, he relinquishes the wand to his baby sister when she's born, that sister eventually becoming Solaria the Monster Carver. Sorry, Justin, this is strictly a matriarchy. From the get-go, Solaria views the previous queens as being weak for not properly dealing with the monsters. She immediately plans to wage a brutal war to keep expanding Muni, and she's fine with either subjugating or killing every monster in the process. Mina Loveberry becomes the first Solarian warrior, 1770. The big break in Solaria's war comes when she develops a triptych of powerful spells that can change any peasant into a super human warrior. These super humans have heightened senses and possess no fear or conscience. Each warrior gets a blade that's fired up by Solaria's wand of aggression so they can kill monsters with one hit. A rag peddler, Mina, volunteers to be the first warrior. She's the head of the butterfly's army for the entirety of her abnormally long and possibly now immortal life. Solaria soon accrues an entire army of super warriors and the war gets incredibly intense. Eclipse meets Globgor, 1773. Even with her super army battalion, Solaria can't stop monsters from advancing on Butterfly Castle. Her daughter Eclipsa is, in Solaria's view, kidnapped by one of the monster commanders, Globgor. Solaria captures the army in the act and reclaims Eclipsa, but Eclipsa continues seeing Globgor in secret as she grows up. The siege on Butterfly Castle ends, 1778. Finally, Solaria sends an envoy led by Hecapu to the Ponyhead Kingdom and the Underworld for reinforcements. Later that year, they return and bring Butterfly Castle back from the brink. And and yet, Solaria turns down the Magical High Commission's suggestion for a ceasefire. She also secretly begins working on a total annihilation spell, you know, like how level-headed generals do. Solaria dies in battle and Eclipsa becomes queen, 1788. Eclipsa inherits the Book of Spells, but doesn't want to be queen anytime soon. However, Solaria suddenly dies in battle, so Eclipsa becomes queen right away. Not only that, but Solaria has written in her will that Eclipsa will marry Prince Shastakan of the Spider Bites, but that doesn't stop Eclipsa from seeing her true love, Globgor, in secret. Eclipsa elopes with Globgor, around 1791. Despite the Romeo and Juliet type romance between Eclipsa and Globgor,
war, the monster army and Solarian warrior-led Muman army continue to fight. Eclipse's vote for an armistice is continually drowned out, and Globgor is dealing with some restless, rebellious Septarians. So, to save the kingdom in a sort of twisted but very romantic way, Eclipsa elopes with Globgor, and that's when things get pretty crazy. As if things weren't already crazy enough, we haven't even gotten to the show itself yet. Star vs. the Forces of Evil has enough lore to make J.R.R. Tolkien be like, whoa, dude. Actually, you know what? Do him and yourself a favor by listening to his works on Audible. The Lord of the Rings trilogy and The Hobbit are both there, but if you want a really deep dive, you should listen to The Silmarillion. It's got all of that good lore that you don't get to hear about in the other books, like this timeline so far. If you're looking for a more recent story, then I recommend you check out Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn series. The world is fully fleshed out, and it makes the fantasy power struggle super compelling, not unlike Star Versus. Oh, and there's magic, and sometimes it goes wrong, but I've said too much already. Just jump into Mistborn, starting with book one, The Final Empire. Okay, okay, so maybe there isn't room in your life for another library's worth of magical, mystical lore, so in that case, just chill out and listen to a classic, Where the Wild Things Are by Maurice Sendak. It's just a simple story about a kid hanging out with monsters. Yep, definitely not a highly studied book or a book with a bizarrely introspective film adaptation directed by Spike Jones. what are you talking about? You can start listening with a 30-day Audible trial, and your first audiobook plus two Audible originals are free. Visit audible.com slash channel frederator or text channel frederator, all one word, to 500-500. Again, that's audible.com slash channel frederator or text channel frederator, one word, to 500-500. Alright, now this Star vs. Timeline has been pretty straightforward, right? Well, it's about to get a little messy. The Princess Swap, around 1792. Eclipsa and Globgor ultimately end up in the Monster Temple where they have a daughter, Meteora. However, when Meteora is still an infant, she's seized from her parents and turned over to Shastakan. Shastakan deems Meteora unfit to rule Muni and wants nothing to do with her, so he gives her to St. Olga of St. Olga's Reform School for Wayward Princesses. Over the years, St. Olga and her clockwork orange-like brainwashing techniques would suppress both Meteora's butterfly and monster characteristics, as well as Meteora's memory of ever having them. Years and years and years later, Meteora, now heinous, would unplug St. Olga, take over her school, and steal the life force of its students to preserve her youth. While listening to thrash metal, that detail is very important. Meanwhile, Shastakan replaces Meteora in the butterfly lineage with a totally random, non-royal, piefold girl who was left behind in Muni after the Pie Carnival. But Shastakan's big mistake was not dealing with Globgor first. Presumably as revenge for tossing away his daughter, Globgor breaks his vegetarian vows and devours Shastakan. That must have caught the Magical High Commission's attention because they crystallized Globgor in the Monster Temple shortly thereafter. And since Eclipsa loves that monster, she gets brought to the Crystal Dimension and also gets crystallized, fearing her allegiance to Globgor makes her a liability. On the bright side, at least the new butterfly line is super good at making pies! There's not a whole lot of bright sides here, everyone kind of sucks. Festivia becomes queen, 1810. After all that, Muni is queenless until Festivia comes of age. The High Commission raised her to believe that she's the daughter of Eclipsa and Shastakan, and that both of her parents were eaten by monsters, which is... Well, it's kind of half true, except that her parents aren't her parents, but you know how it is. As soon as Festivia becomes queen, monsters attack Muman villages and a new war begins. Festivia sends the Solarian warriors off to take complete charge of the war and for safety calls all of the Muman citizens into the castle grounds. Then she does what any of us would do when faced with a war throw a party for literally five years straight, right until the war ends. Mina Loveberry is the only Salarian warrior to survive. Probably explains why it took five years and not five minutes. The Rise of Castle of Arius, 1843. Soon after Festivia's daughter Crescenta becomes queen, she has to address the Septarian problem, which Eclipsa and Globgor must have swept under the rug when they were eloping. The Septarian leader Seth is gaining support from the larger monster population. To undercut his popularity, Crescenta decides to hold an election for a monster monarch, and she campaigns super hard hard for Pema Avarius. She would act in the butterfly's interest in exchange for the money and the power and all that fun stuff. Pema narrowly beats Seth in the election, so hooray! A new era of weird peace with the monsters begins. We'll see how long that lasts. Echo Creek is settled, 1846. Hey, remember Earth? It's fine, at times it felt like even the show couldn't be bothered to remember Earth. As thousands of American families moved westward, the 17 pilgrims in the Bonner Party, with a B, settle in an area that came to be known as Nature's Landfill, or just Echo Creek. But alas, the land's already occupied by a particularly violent and territorial band of opossums. The Bonners emerge victorious in the subsequent 26-day war and build Echo Creek Academy on their hard-won land. Rena the Riddled 
accidentally kills John Roachley around 1880. Anyway, back in Muni, Crescenta's daughter, Queen Rena, doesn't have a very good love life. Her husband, John Roachley, is kind of a dick, so she creates a spell to break his heart. Thing is, it works a little too well and is a little too literal, so it kills him. Since Roachley's the second cousin to the Lucitors, this creates some simmering tensions between humans and the underworld. Estrella the Drafted becomes queen around 1930. Both Estrella and her mother, Selena the Shy, have very chill reigns. Estrella is an avid drawer, so it's a peaceful time for Muni. And apparently whoever gives the queen's nicknames has a sense of humor, because I would have assumed drafted meant, you know, like, conscription, but they meant the drawing kind of drafty. Great job! Not confusing at all. By this time, the Avarius family has fallen from grace, having sunk their fortunes in the corrupt scratch and sniff trade, but their heir, Archduke Batwin, is still popular among the monsters. Comet the Chef becomes queen, 1980. After putting off becoming queen for as long as she possibly could, Comet the Chef takes the throne. She's already an incredibly well-traveled chef with an infant daughter, so she uses her culinary skills to handle the monsters in a different way. Instead of fighting them, Comet's first act as queen is to hold a banquet in honor of the Archduke of Monsters, Batwin. Seth the Septarian dies, somewhere between 1980 and 1995. A group of rebel Septarians led by our old pal Seth are a cause of concern for both Comet and Batwin, but Comet writes that she's not afraid of crusty the old Seth, and she was totally right. For unknown reasons, Seth dies during Comet's reign. Hey, I don't make the news, I just report it. I'm just quoting what Darren Nefsey said herself. There is another Septarian that she should have been afraid of, though. Toffee kills Comet, Moon becomes the queen and frees Eclipsa, and the Muman Monster Accord, 1995. This is a stacked year. Comet devotes her time as queen to cultivating peace with monsters, and after perhaps a little more than a decade, she and Batwin are about to sign a peace treaty. However, one of Batwin's generals, Toffee, rebels and assassinates Comet. Comet's 17-year-old daughter, Moon, immediately becomes queen. With no clue about how to handle the monster situation, Moon asks Romulus to unfreeze Eclipsa long enough for the queens to talk. Moon strikes a deal with Eclipsa. Eclipsa gives Moon one of her dark spells in exchange for her assured freedom once Toffee is killed. Moon uses the spell, but is only able to burn off Toffee's finger permanently, though this hit to his regenerative capabilities is enough to cause he and his rebel army to retreat for the time being. She vows to continue to fight monsters that threaten humans, and the seriousness of her threat soon leads to the Muman Monster Accord. While the exact contents of the Accord are foggy, I assume it says that monsters and humans will leave each other the hell alone. A year later, Moon finally decides which boy she likes and marries River Johansson, all before even going through Muberty. The Births of Star Butterfly and Marco Diaz, 2001. Finally, Star Butterfly is born born to Moon and River Butterfly. So yes, a star is born. Go ahead and make your Lady Gaga references in the comments or preferably that much better song from Hercules. Meanwhile, on Earth, an unlikely force in the changing of the multiverse, Marco Diaz is born to Raphael and Angie Diaz. Ludo Avarius takes control of Castle Avarius, around 2005. Despite their dwindling fortunes, the Avarius family continues to live in their castle. That is, until the entire family goes on vacation without the runt of their 50-egg litter, Ludo. While they're gone, Ludo has his gang of monsters move in and change the locks, running his family out of their home. Ludo then dedicates himself to stealing the wand from the butterfly family. Ponyhead steals Hecapoo's dimensional scissors, around 2014. One would think that the sole forger of all dimensional scissors would be careful with their personal pair, but Hecapoo just leaves them in the bathroom of the Bounce Lounge, a multi-dimensional club. Sure enough, Ponyhead finds and steals them. They'd later go to Star Butterfly, and then Marco would borrow them, consequently screwing it up before being offered a challenge to get his actual own scissors, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Star Butterfly comes to Earth, 2015. Star Butterfly grows up to be a little unruly. Rather than immediately send her to St. Olga's, her parents offer her a second chance to chill out, specifically by going to live on Earth, where she begins living with Marco Diaz and his family. Star meets him at school. That's that's how she meets Marco. They didn't they weren't like friends before she went to Earth or anything. The Blood Moon Ball, still 2015. Every 667 years, the Blood Moon chooses two souls and curses them to be eternally bound. Tom Lucitor, the current heir to the underworld, takes his ex-girlfriend Star to the Blood Moon Ball without mentioning the curse part, but hoping that the curse would pick them. Instead, the curse picks Star and Marco. Womp womp. Ludo Avarius hires Toffee, even still 2015. Meanwhile, Ludo's attempts to get the wand from Star haven't been going well, so he decides to hire some help managing his goons. That help turns out to be Toffee, who slowly begins to take control of Ludo's organization. And Ludo doesn't really notice because he's dumb. Wheel of Progress reconfigured, even more still 2015. So yeah, Father Time has been running around on the Wheel of Time for, uh, forever. So sure, he's in great shape, but you know, doing something forever gets kinda old. Once Star casts a free 
free spell and knocks Father Time off the wheel, he only agrees to get back on once Star reconfigures it into a chariot pulled by hamsters. Miss Haynes is driven out of St. Olga's, 2016. Haynes has been living large, running St. Olga's Reform School for Wayward Princesses with an iron fist, but her haven comes crashing down when Star and Marco infiltrate the school and inspire a rebellion led by one Princess Turdina, actually Marco. The students turn St. Olga's into a party school and kick Haynes out along with her servant Gemini, so Haynes develops an obsessive vendetta against Turdina. The destruction of Castle of Arius, still 2016. Meanwhile, Toffee's patience is paid off. He finally controls Ludo's organization, his gang, and even Castle of Arius itself. Toffee lures Star to the castle and forces her to perform the mysterious whispering spell to destroy her wand, but the only thing that ends up getting destroyed is Castle of Arius and some monsters. The wand gets cleaved and Ludo finds one of the pieces. However, that cleft piece also contains Toffee's consciousness, who was blown up in the magical blast from the wand. Actually, Toffee is corrupting Star's new wand too, because he's contaminated the entire realm of magic. The golden liquid begins turning into a dark, sickly, mucky green. Ludo obtains the Book of Spells later that year. Now that Ludo's on a roll with his wand and his spider and his eagle, he's able to snag the Book of Spells and therefore get relative ownership of Glossaric. Well, as much as anyone can own Glossaric anyway. He takes Glossaric to his new home in the Monster Temple and starts learning, but once he sees the Dark Arts spells in Eclipse's chapter, Ludo makes himself vulnerable to be possessed by Toffee. Meanwhile, Star prepares for her Song Day, a tradition as old as Muni itself, where each queen-to-be formally introduces herself to her subjects. However, Star uses her song to inform the populace about the missing spellbook, so, you know, that goes well. Also, the bard who wrote the song, Rubariot, elects to make some creative choices of his own, revealing through the song that Star has feelings for Marco, and things were awkward until, like, literally the last two episodes of the series, so thanks, Patrick Stump of Fallout Boy. The song's a banger, though. The death of Toffee and Lekmet, and the destruction of the second Book of Spells, 2017. Once Toffee takes over Ludo, his first order of business is to take out the Magical High Commission. Lekmet sacrifices himself to make sure that Moon gets out alive. Ludo, completely on his own accord, destroys the Book of Spells out of frustration. Glossaric ultimately survives, but his mind is kind of damaged. All he can do is shout, Globcore! However, Toffee, as the voice in Ludo's one, does convince Ludo to take over Butterfly Castle, but his reign is short-lived. Long story short, Moon gives Toffee his finger back, and Star re purifies the corrupted realm of magic and blasts Toffee into smithereens. And then Ludo crushes him and delivers the best one-liner of the series. It turns out she did. <laughs> Star moves back to Muni, and Marco shortly joins her as her squire. But since Toffee is actually dead now, Eclipse is freed as per her agreement with Moon. The Magical High Commission immediately declares her to be evil, but Star convinces them to give Eclipse a trial and let her hang out in her room in the castle until then. Haynes remembers, still 2017. Meanwhile, after a failed attempt to reclaim Mistress Ship of St. Olga's, Haynes continues pursuing her arch nemesis, Princess Turdina. She makes her move during a party Star is holding at the supposedly re-abandoned Monster Temple, a mixer for teenage humans and monsters to improve relations. And it goes great, except that Mina Loveberry has started camping out in the temple and begins capturing the monster guests. Then Hainus stumbles across her old bedroom from her forgotten infancy. Mina reveals Hainus's actual identity, Eclipse's daughter Meteora, for those of you who need a reminding. But before things can get too saucy, the Magical High Commission intervenes. Hainus slowly begins to regain some of her monster traits. The cover-up unveiled, and Eclipsa becomes queen. Again, still 2017. While preparing for Eclipse's trial, Moon and Eclipsa discover that Meteora, aka Haynes, has been completely erased from the history books and replaced with a stranger named Festivia. Moon, Eclipsa, and Star make Eclipsa's trial a very dramatic trial by box, which forces the Magical High Commission to admit their cover-up or, you know, die of being crushed. But that means that Star and Moon figure out that they're not actually true butterflies. Meanwhile, Haynes shakes Saint Olga down for the truth about her past as Meteora. Now knowing that the throne is rightfully hers, she destroys Saint Olga along with Ponyhead's horn and continues to grow more monster-like. And like, way bigger. She also learns how to balloonify people and shoot lasers out of her eyes. Eclipsa intervenes in Moon's fight with Meteora, accidentally sending Moon to the realm of magic. With Moon's whereabouts unknown, she's presumed basically dead and Star unexpectedly becomes queen. Star goes to find Moon in the realm of magic, but they both get magic brained and sent back to where they belong. For Star, that means Muni, but for Moon, that's back with the Pi Folk. Also, since Moon has used dark magic, she begins contaminating the magic pool. Just a little bit. Over time. When Star gets back to Muni, she sees that Meteora has 
has set fire to Butterfly Kingdom, destroyed Butterfly Castle, and sucked almost everyone's soul out. In the ensuing battle, Eclipsa tags Star out of the fight so she can destroy Meteora herself, her own child. Yet miraculously, Eclipsa's spell reverts Meteora back into a cute baby. Star decides that the throne and the wand are rightfully Eclipsa's. Eclipsa moves the queen's functions away from the destroyed Butterfly Castle and into the monster temple where Globgor is still crystallized. From there, she immediately integrates Muman and Monster Society, which lots of Muman's aren't too happy about. In fact, it's everybody, and they hate it. Everyone hates Eclipsa. Except the fans. We love Eclipsa. Star, Marco, and River dedicate themselves to finding Moon, and after they do, Star opts to stay and help Eclipsa while River and Moon go into the nearby woods and build a yurt, cause why not? After taking up residence there, Moon encounters lots of disgruntled humans whose homes were either destroyed or reclaimed by monsters. Soon enough, she finds herself acting as the de facto queen of a new budding city. The Blood Moon Curse is removed. 2017. J just the rest of the series is 2017. Meanwhile, it becomes painstakingly obvious to everyone that Marco and Star have lingering feelings for each other, though Star doesn't want to admit it. Tom reveals that the Blood Moon Ball was, in fact, a curse, so he ventures with Star and Marco into the underworld and has the curse removed. Castle of Arius is reclaimed. Ludo's brother Dennis purchases the ruins of Castle of Arius from one evil Jay Landbaron, who gives me Professor Radigan vibes. Problem is, the contract actually forces him to hand over the entire of Arius family fortune, as well as the castle, so Ludo does what any good brother would do. He takes care of the evil landlord and reunites the of Arius family, minus the lackluster parents to rebuild the castle. Moon conspires against Eclipsa and Globgor is freed. Moon discovers that a rumored ghost in Butterfly Castle is actually good old Mina Loveberry, who's been protecting the abandoned castle from looters, but she's also kind of sort of scheming to kill Eclipsa. The way Mina sees it, Eclipsa is allowing a bunch of dirty monsters to ruin our beautiful kingdom. Moon eventually agrees to work with Mina to take down Eclipsa, believing she's stopping Mina from doing far worse. Moon and Mina rebuild the Solarian warrior army with citizens of Moon's mini city. Moon also convinces Romulus to uncrystallize Globgor during Eclipse's coronation and frame Eclipsa for it, but that ends up backfiring wildly because Globgor's instinct is actually to run away so Eclipsa won't get into trouble. I mean, she kinda does anyway, but the sentiment is there. Globgor's kind of a cinnamon roll. Even though Romulus tries to convince everyone that Globgor is an evil Muman eater, Star figures him out. Globgor is so obviously just a concerned dad that Muni's population eventually votes to accept him as king. The end of magic. That doesn't sway the magical High Commission, Moon, and Mina from their plan, though. The commission shuts down the portal to Muni. After Mina's army begins attacking Monster Castle, Moon strikes another deal with Eclipsa and convinces her to surrender the wand and title of Queen back to Moon. However, Mina isn't satisfied just yet, since she and her soldiers pledge their loyalty to Queen Solaria. She doesn't have to listen to Moon. So Mina continues killing monsters and monster sympathizers as she pleases. Star realizes that the only way to stop the overpowered Solarian army from completely destroying Muni is to get rid of magic altogether. Besides, magic's done nothing but cause problems in, like, its entire existence. So she, Eclipsa, Moon, and even Little Meteora go to the Realm of Magic and perform the Whispering Spell on the entire realm. All the Solarian warriors' powers are stripped away, but destroying the magic also destroys every being made of magic, which includes Glossaric and the members of the Magical High Commission, and nothing of value was lost. It also means no more dimension hopping and that everyone has returned to their native dimension, which is a problem for Star and Marco, our dimension-crossed lovers. Both of them jump back into the Realm of Magic just before it's destroyed. They're sent back to their home dimensions, but a wormhole portal appears on both Earth and Muni. When the portal shrinks, the two dimensions combine into one. The series ends with the two that started it all, Star and Marco, who are finally able to be together. So that covers our timeline of events, but we didn't really even mention the real war in this video, which is the shipping wars. Starco supporters, please feel free to gloat in the comments, and everybody else, uh, please put your reasoning for why Kelly should have ended up with Marco. Those are the only, the, uh, those are the only two answers that I'll accept. Those and Tomco. Anyway, I've been Jacob with Channel Frederator, and thanks for watching our Star vs. the Forces of Evil timeline. Don't forget to subscribe, and remember, Frederator loves you.